I'm back. Okay, first song. Let's take the keys off. And um, today's lecture, we're focused on the labor movement. But before I go into details about this movement, I just want to recap what I've been telling kids in general. Um, what a movement is, um, its purpose, and overall what it hopes to achieve. So what is a movement? A movement is an organized way of bringing people together under one common goal. Um, usually it's a, it involves, let me back this up, usually it involves a group of people that may feel underrepresented. Um, it's usually, it usually involves a group of people that may feel underserved, underrepresented. Um, they may feel as if they don't have a voice in this society, a voice in our government. Um, they usually feel disenfranchised, excluded, ostracized, you get it? So as I always say, there are power, there's power in numbers and the best way to get someone's attention is to bring people together that have the same sentiments in hopes of provoking some change at the end of the movement. So movements bring people together under one common goal and it's usually to get the public's attention. And by getting the public's attention, you are now able to get the government's attention, which will then provoke some change, which usually um, is done in the form of some type of legislation. Now we all know laws are good, but they're useless if it's not enforced. And they're useless if the people don't change socially. So, this quarter, we're going to focus on a lot of movements like populism, the labor movement, civil rights movement, and the progressive movement. Um, what I'm hoping is that you understand the causes, course, and consequence of each movement and take it to the next level by connecting it to some of the movements that we are currently witnessing today in 2019. For example, your Black Lives Matter movement, your Me Too movement, um, the gay rights movement, come on. There's so much that we can take from these movements and you will see a lot of similarities and you will see that <clears throat> the mistakes that are made in these movements um, are not being repeated in the movements of our society today. So let's get into it, labor movement. What will I be covering? Cause, course, effects. Cause, course, effects. Starting with problems, okay? The cause is what triggered all of these workers to come together under one common goal. It was all the problems that they were having. Starting with the fact that these industrial workers were working long hours. And when I say long hours, I'm talking about 12 hour shifts. In some cases, 16 hour shifts, seven days a week. Most workers today in the United States of America work only eight hour shifts. And if they work beyond those eight hour shifts or beyond 40 hours a week, they are compensated with overtime. Overtime did not exist. Labor laws did not exist. So it allowed industrialists like Andrew Carnegie, JP Morgan, and Rockefeller to take advantage of their workers by imposing long hours um, seven days a week. That sucked. They needed a day off. They're tired. Two, boring, repetitive tasks. In other words, they're basically doing the same thing every single day for 12 to 16 hour shifts. That sucks. Okay, in addition, <laughs> No talking. It sounds like school. <laughs> I thought it was corny, but this is not school. This is definitely not my class, and don't you dare throw shade or comment, because you know this class is not boring. We don't do things repetitively, and I allow you guys to talk. 
Could you imagine if my classroom was boring, repetitive, and no talking? Could you imagine coming to school and being forced to turn in your cell phones the moment you walk on campus? Not happening, and you wouldn't be happy as well. Problem number three, low wages. Understand this. I love what I do. I've been doing this for 14 years, but I need some money, okay? And in the case of the industrial workers, the wages sucked, okay? They were not compensated when compared to the amount of work that they were putting in. So they most definitely were not satisfied with the wages. And we saw examples of that with Andrew Carnegie. Next, dangerous conditions. Could you imagine coming to work and having your hand cut off due to the fact that there are no safety codes or um, just in general an environment where one would feel safe? I mean, could you provide us with some gloves, goggles, helmets, things that we unfortunately take for granted today um, was not accessible to industrial workers back in the late 18, early 1900s. You had some individuals that would go to work and not come back home because they're dead. Yes, they're dead. Next, child labor. Children were working, and I know some of you have jobs, but there are child labor laws that have been put in place to protect you as a minor. So for example, most of you are not able to go out and get a job until you're 16. Um, your employer should not be assigning you more than 20 to 25 hours per week. Um, things of that nature, things that you guys don't like, these children need it because you had children as young as eight, nine, ten years old working in a factory and not attending school and getting a proper education. So this was a huge problem because we were now living in a society where education was not a priority. The priority was to help these industrialists continue to get rich while the working class continued to stay poor. And I just want to add, there was no middle class. Why wasn't there a middle class? Because there was no room or ladder for, you know, some type of advancement. How do you advance? What's the number one way to advance the working class? Education. If the children are not at school, then that middle class isn't um, foreseeable, foreseeable in the future. Okay. Next, no benefits, no health insurance, no social security, um, no pensions. If a worker were to lose their job, they would not be able to collect an unemployment check. So why am I working for someone and there's no protection? There's no, no end game. The only benefits are to the industrialists. This is a major problem. And last, lack of opportunity or advancement. You had a bunch of workers that were not able to grow. Okay, there was a glass ceiling that was right here on top of the worker's head. They weren't able to grow, which could justify why they were not able to get a raise or be provided with benefits. So when you take into account low wages, long hours, boring and repetitive tasks, lack of opportunity and advancement is going to create a situation where workers are angry, tired, and fed up, which explains why they decided to rally themselves together and form what we call today Labor unions. Labor unions are organizations, they're groups of workers striving together to achieve better working conditions. Some of the goals that most, if not all, labor unions share would be obtaining higher wages, better working conditions, establishing funds 
that provide protection for these workers in the future and which I think is key in the success of any labor union is to apply pressure on our government. In other words, get the government's attention and have some type of influence on the government so that way they could also meet the demands not only of the industrialist or your CEO, but also the hardworking American. Hopefully I'm not going too fast. If I am, pause, look at your assignment, and fill in the blanks. Also, this PowerPoint can be found on Canvas, so if you're missing anything, you can always go to Canvas, download the PowerPoint, and get all the info that you need. So let's get back into it. We have two labor unions that we could look at um, as an example for the labor unions that were in existence during the early 1900s. One in particular is called the Knights. Okay, I was not good. Okay, we working. Oh, no, we're not. Okay, Knights of Labor, okay? This organization was founded by Terrence Howderly. Hopefully I pronounced that correctly, who cares? But um, what I like about his organization was that he actually allowed skilled and unskilled workers to become members of his organization. A huge plus was the fact that African Americans could also seek membership because a lot of these labor unions excluded African Americans as well as immigrants from seeking membership into their organizations. Um, they were really big on fighting for workers to only have eight hour work days. Of course, they wanted higher wages and they wanted safety codes put in place. They wanted their workers to go to work in a safe environment. I mean, something so simple today was major back then. They opposed shape. Uh, they opposed child labor. Um, they supported equal pay for women. So in my opinion, they were very progressive. Um, they were against immigration. Okay, you have to understand the times. Um, and when, when, when we discuss immigration in US history, immigrants at this time in history were viewed as the competitor. They were viewed as competition for these jobs. So, in most cases, your immigrants were not popular. And if you ask me, they're still not popular today, but that's a whole nother YouTube video, and hopefully I can throw that out. All right. Unfortunately, despite all of the good, this labor union was guilty by association, meaning they were associated with very radical and unpopular ideas specifically those that we labeled as anarchists. An anarchist is someone that believes in overthrowing a capitalist society and just allowing the people in that society to self-govern themselves. So when people would hear thoughts of anarchy, they thought that those people were crazy, lunatics, almost like how we um, classify your typical terrorists today. So yeah, because they were associated with those um, individuals, you know, the Knights of Labor did not last very long. And um, they were viewed almost like a terrorist organization, like the Taliban today. Um, they were viewed as a threat to society um, due to a lot of other things and um, some of their tactics like their strikes. Let's talk about the AFL, the American Federation of Labor. This organization was founded by Sam Gumpers. You will find in your textbook that this organization is presented in a more positive light as opposed to the Knights of Labor. Um, and I'll explain to you why they're viewed in, in a much higher regard. But just to give you some information about them, skilled workers only. I didn't like that. And I most definitely didn't like the fact that African Americans were not able to seek membership into this particular union. Uh, they created a platform where 
if they bargain for something, those bargaining results or benefits were only for their members. So unlike the Knights of Labor, they were only working for those that seek membership. And I'm pretty sure there was a fee to become a member. Um, like I said, they believed in bargaining. They believed in sitting down and having a discussion and negotiating with their employees. I'm not against that. And I believe the Knights of Labor were in support of bargaining as well, but due to them being guilty by association, history will never tell you that. They're gonna always portray this organization as the troublemaker and this one as like a peacemaker, okay? Um, a great tactic that was executed by this organization was the fact that they seeked political candidates that supported their objective and their organization. That is a major key, guys, and it's still a major key in today's society. If you want to see change in your government, vote. Seek candidates that have the same vision as you, and that's when you start to see the government do the work, at least the work that you agree with. So they supported political candidates. Let's take a moment. Um, but like I said, I wasn't happy with the fact that they only allowed skilled workers in. Because as, as you can see here, unskilled workers were not allowed into their organization. African Americans were not allowed into their organization. I'm pretty sure immigrants were also excluded. But because of them excluding unskilled African Americans and immigrants, that also contributed to their demise. That in essence was their weakness because if you're not including all of these different people, then that means most workers were not union members. And if you want to see change, you need to have the numbers. And they didn't have the numbers. No numbers. Moving on. So let's discuss the tactics. Tactics are also known as strategies. So we've talked about causes, which are basically the problems that they have. And right now we're in the midst of discussing the course, the things that they were doing to invoke some type of change. What have they done thus far? They have decided to organize and come together by forming a labor union. And I just gave you two examples of labor unions in US history. Let's talk about the tactics that they executed as an organization. It's loud. All right. Tactics of the labor unions are here. Tactics of management. Another word for management, the employer. Another word for employer, boss. Boss like Rick Ross. Okay, back to the, the lesson. So labor unions often would go on strike. But the truth is, going on strike was a last resort. They would often go to the employer and attempt to bargain. And when bargaining was unsuccessful, they would result to striking. But the strikes usually started off very peaceful with a simple protest. What was the objective of protesting in addition to going on strike? Well, let me back this up. When you go on strike, you as a worker just don't go to work. And you go to work knowing that you won't get paid. You go to work knowing that you may lose your job. But what you're hoping is that the employer will see the value in you not attending work and then bargain with you. So you want your employer to see that, hey, we know you want to make money, but you can't do it without us. And if that clicks in the minds of the employer, then perhaps they'll be willing to bargain. So back to the strikes. You go on strike, you stay home, you watch TV. Well, in this case, it was on TV. So you go home and you, you chill, okay? 
Um, but in some cases, they would protest and they would go out in front of the, the employer's location site or facility site. And the purpose of doing that is to draw public attention. Because like I said at the beginning of this discussion, you want to bring forth some type of awareness. You want public opinion to change, which will then force the government to change. So were they able to get the public's attention? Yes. But unfortunately, the public viewed them as troublemakers. Troublemakers, um, people that promoted more chaos. They were viewed as a threat to the economy. So this tactic was good, but the outcome was bad for labor unions. So now you're living in a society where labor unions are now being viewed as troublemakers, unfortunately. Now, going on strike meant not getting paid. So prior to a strike, they would always establish what is called a strike fund to assist those workers that were willing to take that chance because they were taking a chance. If you went on strike and your employee, employer was aware that you're not at work because you're on strike, you would just lose your job. And we all know, you know, you gotta pay those bills. So. Those were their tactics. Um, in some cases, it wasn't successful because the public did not receive it as such, okay? Management, your employer, what were their tactics? They would fire strikers. They would also have what we call lockouts. So if the employee is requesting a pay raise, they'll say, no, we're not gonna give you a pay raise and we're gonna lock you out of your job because by locking you out, you don't get paid. So you're getting fired, you're having lockouts. Um, if employees went on strike, they would send strike breakers to break up the protest, which in most cases was peaceful, but because you're sending these folks out, a peaceful protest has now become violent, which is not making their reputation any better, right? And then if the, employees did not show up to work, they had replacements. We call those scabs, okay? Scabs were individuals willing to work for the industry when the strikers went on strike. Guess who the scabs were? African-Americans and immigrants, which further contributed to this racial divide in our society. I'm not making excuses for the unions, but why would you allow African-Americans membership into a union if they're the ones replacing you during a strike? Get it? All right. They would also have yellow dog contracts, which are contracts that employees would have to sign agreeing to never become a member of an organization like a labor union, which explains why most workers were not union members. Um, employees, if it was like rumored that you were a known striker, you would be blacklisted from getting jobs from other companies or industries. You have picker tones, which were individuals that were spies. We call those individuals today the ops, okay? You have people that you go to work with who's like, why are you always snitching? Why are you always checking to see who's showing up late, who's leaving early? Those are your picker tones. So they worked for the employer, despite the fact that they were an employee. They worked for the employer to continue to resist what the unions were trying to achieve. And then you have injunctions. Injunctions are court orders, which gave the employer the power to um, break up strikes, which explains why the strikes would often turn violent. Public opinion, the labor unions are the problem, but the truth is management tactics is what triggered so much violence during the strikes. All right, so where does the government, I mean, I wouldn't say where, what role did the government play in this story or in this movement? The truth is they were on the side 
of the industrialists and the employers because at that moment in history, they viewed their role to simply protect private property. And they were more concerned with a vulnerable economy. In other words, their perspective of, of an economy depended on the employer. And they never took into consideration that a thriving economy can only continue to thrive when the employee is treated fairly, when the employee is compensated properly, when the employee is put in an environment that is safe and not dangerous. We weren't at that level yet, and trust me, the government will come to that realization, but right now, they were being controlled by industrialists like Andrew Carnegie, because if you look at my PowerPoint, I say here, businesses had a stranglehold on government leaders. They were being bribed through political campaign contributions. So if you're a politician during this time in history, who are you going to listen to? A worker with no bread or Andrew Carnegie with a lot of bread? Get it? All right. So because they were being controlled, we lived in a society where the government was hands off. Laissez fair economics. We're all familiar with that. Don't forget that. All right. So something else that we need to understand. Despite the government not wanting to protect workers, uh, they if, even if they wanted to protect or help unions, the unions didn't have enough members. So that goes back to what I always tell you guys. There's power in numbers. How can you get the government's attention if you don't even have enough members to get their attention? You get it? So. What was the role of the government? They were on the side of the employers, they were on the side of the industrialists, because in their mind, that is how you maintain a thriving economy, in addition to being bribed and influenced with money. Okay, so how much influence did the industrialists have on our government? They had so much influence that they convinced the government to label strikes as an illegal act. They went so far to label strikes as an illegal act that they actually included it in the Sherman Antitrust Act. If you know the Sherman Antitrust Act, it was a legislation that labeled monopolies. As, as an organization that is illegal, and a threat to our economy. Okay, so monopolies are illegal and they're a threat to our economy. And when you look at it in that aspect, just take out the word monopoly and now add the word strikes. So now strikes are viewed as a threat to our economy, which is why they were also labeled illegal. Okay, that was so powerful, which explains why labor unions were not able to see um, a lot of success. They weren't able to, to reap the benefits of their hard work. So let's talk about strikes. How many of them took place? More than 20,000 strikes. So that automatically tells me that the employers really were not, as you guys would say, shaking nothing. They weren't shaking nothing. They weren't willing to negotiate. They were, they were not willing to bargain with these employees, which resulted in over 20,000 strikes. Okay, most strikes usually turn violent, not because of the strikers, but because of law enforcement, but because of the fact that um, these industries would hire strike breakers to come in it caused trouble because they wanted public opinion to portray the labor unions as what again? 
the troublemakers. We got to make them look like they're the problem and we're not the problem. Because if, if public opinion continues to view labor unions, hold on. Six, seven. Okay, I'm recording. Who's this? I'm recording my YouTube and like I'm like right in the middle of recording. Sure, who's this? Okay, all right, okay. It's got more than twenty thousand strikes, term violent due to the law enforcement, not the strikers. Um, some strikers were often jailed, killed, um, and I believe making the strikes turn violent was to keep public opinion against labor unions by continuing to label them as troublemakers, which stalled their progress on behalf of the industrial workers. Um, I mean, the government wasn't on their side either because they would usually send troops. Yeah, no, I hate that. 